Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, or my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but see. buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you, I was grieving but not alive. All my failures I tried to my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day.
Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran. Into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. I can see a promised land, though there's pain within the plan. There is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry. When my fears like Jericho build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. There is hope within the fight, in the wars that rage inside. Though the shadows steal the light, your love is my battle cry, the anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past you've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. No greater name, no higher name. No stronger name than Jesus. You overcame, broke every chain, forever reign. King Jesus, no greater name, no higher name, no stronger name than Jesus. You overcame, broke every chain, forever reign. King Jesus, every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past, you've broken into over fear, over lies, we're singing the truth, that nothing is impossible, every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past, You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you.
You make this sinner holy and holy. Holy. Cause your glory is so beautiful. I fall onto my knees in awe. Your glory is so beautiful. I fall onto my knees in awe. And the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your light. Because your glory is so Let us be you, let us be you. 
just be you on this earth. Let us be you. Good morning, church family. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning, church family. All right, there we go. Let's sing together this morning. I wonder if so this, I will be sinning. I would let my Savior in. Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise and welcome everyone. Today is the day. Eli is here and we want to make sure everyone remembers the reception for him right after worship service. There will be adult classes, but if you want to go see him, head to the teen center later and say hello. Whether you are a new member or a frequent visitor, we're glad you're here. Please join us for our three week introductory class, SR 101, to learn more about the church here at Saturn Road and how you can become a vital part of our community. The classes will be today and the next three Sundays during class time. Come to the church conference room if this sounds interesting. CPR, Care, Play, Read, is right around the corner. We're looking forward to another great summer of volunteer help along with plenty of support staff. However, we need you to fill out the volunteer sign-up form via the email sent out by Kate Hughes. You may visit the information desk for more details. As Luke says in chapter 8, no one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Here you go, guys. I knew y'all could do it. I want to thank y'all for being here this morning. I want to thank those who are watching online as well. So I only have one announcement today. We have some new members that place membership with us, a new uh, family with us. It's Paul, Bailey, and Noah Ayers. If you are here, will you please stand? over there guys that's awesome if you take your time to welcome them to our new to their new home they would, I'm sure they would appreciate that so I want to apologize because um, today is a very special day for us especially for the teens over here but um, my apologies for for Eli I apologize because they allowed me to come up here and tell corny dad jokes during the announcements. I'm, I'm sorry. For example, um, <sighs> why do basketball players not allow to, tr to go on vacation? Because they're not allowed to travel. I'm sorry. Or, what do you call brand new youth minister? Nope. Fresh meat. Okay, I'm not taking credit for any of those jokes. I'll give credit to Glenda Lee and Lucy, my daughter. So you can decide whose was whose joke. Love you, brother.
Good morning. If I can have my fellow elders join me on stage, we're going to charge Eli this morning. This is Eli. Welcome. And also wanted to acknowledge Eli's parents who are with us this morning. Rob and Raylan are here this morning, so glad to have you all. All right, you ready? Yes, sir. All right. Eli, we're glad you're here. <laughs> it's been a long road, and we're glad you're here. The elders of Saturn Road Church of Christ would like to read this charge for you. First, we charge you before God in this body to commit yourself to the Lord. In Matthew 22, when the Pharisees asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said the following, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Although you will be serving at Saturn Road as a youth minister, your first commitment is to continuously pursue your relationship with God. You must serve God before everything else, and in fact, it's in putting God first that you best serve the body here. Second, we charge you before God in this body to commit yourself to the pursuit of God's word. Psalms 119 says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditated on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Pursue God's word not just in pursuit of instruction for us, the people of God here at Saturn Road, but as nourishment for your soul. Then let the living waters flow from your heart to ours. Finally, we charge you before God in this body to preach the word, especially to our youth. In, uh, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. We want your wisdom, we want your experience, we want your excitement and your energy, but what we need most is the all-sufficient Word of God. So never cease feeding us with it. Own whom God made you to be, own what He has laid out for you to do, and do not waver from your unique gifts as well as your identity in Christ. Eli, do you accept this charge? Yes, sir, I do. Awesome. Amen. Amen. We're so excited that you're joining the body here. Look forward to witnessing your gifts and sharing all that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart. Let's join in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for Eli. Bless his ministry here. Bless his walk with you. Bless all that he sets his hand to as your servant. Be with him. Keep him safe from the evil one. Give him wisdom and discretion in the service. Bless the youth as Eli and Kevin minister to them. And help each of us to hear and see you in all that they do. Allow each of us to see Jesus through the ministry that they offer. It's in the blessed name of our Savior Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Congratulations. You're here. Have a. A special announcement or a statement from your eldership. And I'm sure you share with me the disgust at the shooting in Allen yesterday. These are hard times. There, there seems to be a mass shooting almost weekly. And, you know, we, we can't legislate that out of our lives. What we can do is be the hands and feet of Jesus. We need to identify 
people that we can reach out to. Bring them into here. Bring them into services. We have a children's minister. We have two youth ministers. We have a community outreach minister. We have an excellent preacher. We have a great uh, involvement minister and a great pastoral minister. We can bring in people and we can feed them the Word of God in classes, in CPR, in VBS, in summer trips, mission trips, camps. But we need each one of you to engage with people and bring them in. Be the light in someone's life. Almost all of these situations are disaffected young males that need leadership in their lives. They need mentorship. They need you. They need Christ. They need the living word of God. And every one of you who is a baptized Christian is blessed with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Engage that Holy Spirit who has promised you he will lead you to say what you need to say when you are presented with a, an opportunity to be a mentor to someone troubled. Every one of us, I feel sure, knows a family member, a neighbor, a school friend, a classmate, a, a co-worker, the child of a co-worker, somebody who needs Jesus Christ. And the living God can bring about change. And the living God can bring about change through our hands and feet. And I want us to rise up as a community at Saturn Road to be a light to our community around us and help change lives, affect lives for good, affect lives for Christ. Bring God to people. And let's see an end to this violence that is so senseless, so pitiful that someone would shoot a five-year-old or a 61-year-old or any of those in between that were killed yesterday. And we, we can rise up as people of God. And I would encourage you, be absolutely in prayer for all the people affected already, but be in prayer for those who may be the next person that would act out violently when they could just act out because of a love response to them brought to them by the people of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will open our eyes to those that need you and, and give us the words we need as you've already promised, that we can bring about change in lives that will be a meaningful change for generations to come. We will never understand the, the disordered thought that leads to someone to have no regard for human life. But we understand what Jesus Christ means to us and means to the community and means to each person that you've already told us we need to go teach. We pray it will be people of courage and boldness in presenting your word to the world. We pray that thou start here one, one person at a time because we know our, our legislatures, legislative actions just can't do it. We just can't rely on government fixes what we can rely on is the truth of you the everlasting ever loving god jehovah god in jesus name amen i'm thankful to our eldership for them coming up here and addressing that this morning it's also important for us to remember that there's darkness all around us, but Scripture says that the darkness is not strong enough to overcome the light, right? And so as we're here this morning, we don't sing more timidly because we're sad or we're upset. We sing out because the light is strong. And when we pray, we're not praying out of fear. We're praying because we have hope that the Lord is going to redeem all these things. And so this morning as we worship together, uh, let's worship out and let the darkness know that it's not strong enough to overcome the light. So let's stand together. We're going to read a few scriptures. This morning we're talking about rest. It's important for us to rest. It's important for us to rest so that we can spend time with our Lord and Savior. And that's the focus of our scriptures this morning. So as we read through these, think about what Jesus was doing during these times what other believers were doing during this time and how that helped them focus their relationship with the Lord. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
Yet the news about him spread all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Let's sing together this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
morning. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, um, we don't know what to say. Uh, we we come to you asking for your rest, asking for your peace, and we know that it's available for us to take. Help us to focus on you. Help us to feel your presence and your peace. Please help us to remember that you are always with us and you're always working in the world and in our lives. Thank you for giving us the insurance of your son. And it's in his name I pray. I would just want to reiterate real quick what Ty said and thank the elders, the shepherds, for addressing what happened yesterday. I think it's important uh, that the church address things that happen in our community, in our society, and in our country. And I just want to thank the eldership for their willingness to do that. 
And I want to thank Robbie for his willingness to do that too. It is, um, it's important for the church to speak up. And um, it's exciting to know that this congregation does that. In times of tragedy, and I will tell you that I, I wrote my communion stuff yesterday, and then I rewrote it after 3.30, actually this morning, um, when the news about Alan came out. So, so just bear with me. It might be a little lengthy, but um, in times of tragedy, it can be difficult to find comfort and hope. However, Jesus offers a message of love, compassion, and redemption that can bring solace to those who are suffering. Jesus himself experienced great suffering during his time on earth, including betrayal, persecution, and ultimately a painful death. But despite those trials, he remained steadfast in his faith. He demonstrated an unwavering commitment to serving others. Through his teaching and example, Jesus offers us a powerful message of hope and resilience. He reminds us that even in the darkest of times, we are not alone, and that with faith and perseverance, we can overcome even the greatest challenges. Moreover, Jesus promises, and his promise of eternal life offers a sense of comfort and peace that can help us find meaning and purpose in the midst of tragedy. His message of love and forgiveness inspires us to extend grace to ourselves and others to strive for a world filled with compassion and understanding. And ultimately, Jesus' message offers us a powerful source of hope and inspiration during times of tragedy. We focus on his teachings and his example. There we can find strength and resilience that we need to overcome even the most difficult circumstances. To live a life filled with love, with joy, and with purpose. In light of love, joy, and purpose, today we celebrate the arrival of a new minister. A new minister that will guide our youth on a spiritual journey. It's a moment of great joy and excitement as we welcome him with open arms and hearts. So as we reflect on the occasion, it's natural to draw parallels between the arrival of a new minister and the arrival of Jesus. Both represent new beginnings, new opportunities, and new hope for our community. Just as Jesus came to bring salvation and to guide us on our paths towards righteousness, Eli comes to lead our youth on their spiritual journey and to help us deepen their faith. Just as Jesus called upon us to love one another and to serve those in need, Eli will challenge them and us to live out our faith in tangible ways to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. So as we gather around the table to partake in communion, we remember the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. He willingly gave his life so that we may have eternal life. He left us with the command to remember him through the sharing of bread and wine. Today, as we partake in the bread, let us reflect on the significance of this symbol. It represents the body of Christ, broken for us. It's a reminder of the immense love that he has for us and the links that he was willing to go to save us from our sins. Just as the bread is made from many individual grains that are ground together to form one cohesive loaf, so too are we as the body of Christ made up of many individuals. We are all unique and different, but through Christ we are united in a common purpose and a shared identity. As we partake in the bread, let us remember that we are all part of the body of Christ. We're called to love and serve one another, to bear each other's burdens, to support each other through the highs and the lows of life. Let us remember that just as the bread sustains our physical bodies, so too does Christ sustain us spiritually. He is the bread of life. Through him we are nourished and sustained on our journey of faith. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we partake in the bread with grateful hearts, Father, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, committing ourselves to live as members 
of the body of Christ, united in love and in service. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we continue in our communion service, we turn our attention to the wine represents the blood of Christ that he shed for us. It's through his blood we're redeemed and we're made whole. And it is through his sacrifice that we are able to come before the throne of God with confidence. The wine symbolizes the new covenant that Christ established with his disciples. It's a reminder of the depth of his love for us. He willingly shed his blood so that we may have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. As we partake in the wine, let us remember that it's a symbol of our unity with Christ and our unity with each other. Just as the grapes are crushed and blended together to form the wine, so too are we as the body of Christ. United through his sacrifice. And through the blood of Christ, we are forgiven, we're made righteous, we are reconciled to God. We are no longer separated from him, but instead we are brought into his family as sons and as daughters. Let us pray. Father, let us partake of the wine with grateful hearts, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, Father. Committing ourselves to live as though as those who have been redeemed, as those who have been made whole by his blood. Father, may we always remember the depth of Christ's love for us, that we'll never take that for granted, Father. The forgiveness and the new life that he offers us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
There's an importance of offering in our worship and in our daily lives as followers of Christ. The offering's not just about giving money or resources to the church. It's an act of worship. It's a demonstration of our trust in God's provision. And as we give, we acknowledge that everything we have is a gift from God. We trust him to provide us, and provide for us in all areas of our lives. Biblically, we see many examples of offerings as an act of worship. In the Old Testament, people would offer sacrifices to God. It's a way of expressing their devotion and their thankfulness. In the New Testament, we see Jesus commending the widow who gave two small coins, saying that she had given more than all others because she gave out of her poverty and from her heart. When we give our offering, we're participating in this long tradition of worship and trust. We're saying to God that we believe in his provision. We are grateful for all that he has given us. We're also supporting the work of the church, contributing to the mission of spreading the gospel and serving our communities. But offering is not just about what we do in church. It's also about how we live our daily lives. We're called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God using our time, our talents, and our resources to serve others and bring glory to his name. Let's pray. Father, as we give our offering today in church and in our daily lives, let us do with joy, joyful hearts, grateful hearts. Father, let us trust in God's provision. Father, let us use the resources that you have given us to further your kingdom, to bless those around us. Father, may our offering be a reflection of our love for you and our commitment to following you. In your name we pray. Amen.
So as we sing this last song of the message, we talk a lot about rest, and this song has beautiful words of something that you can just reflect on. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to another day that God has made. If you are watching online, if you are here, maybe for the first time, if you are visiting, I hope that you are getting an inkling as to uh, what type of church uh, this is. Uh, it is a church where everyone belongs. Um, we are not trying to... Uh, be uh, fractured. We are just trying as people that are beautifully broken to invite the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God to form us, to mature us, to, to lead us. And so I've been having a blast getting to know, getting to be ministered to by people here because this is a very different church. And if you stick around long enough, you will feel it and you will see it. I am grateful for elders who will stand in defiance of chaos, stand in defiance of fear, and say what needs to be said. Um, I love our elders, and I think we don't give them enough credit because we think it's an easy job or task to lead people. And for them, it's not a task. I've sat around the table with them, and I've seen them, even with differences of opinions among themselves. But they submit to one another as they submit to God because at the end of the day, 
They are pushing for God's will to be done and for his body to mature and find their places of ministry. And so we have a gift that God has given us, godly men, not to capitulate or to just to have one voice for one section of persons, but to speak for all persons as we come on the, the foundation, on the, the direction of, of God. Yeah, for elders. Eli, uh, welcome. We've been praying for you, we've been excited, and um, let me just put my two cents in. Um, number one, uh, if somebody takes you out to eat and they want to pay, let them pay, okay? Um, <laughs> don't fight it because there's going to come a day when they will say, hey, let's just go Dutch. You pay, I pay. Um, secondly, if somebody ask you something just say you don't know you have a year and some to not know so embrace it because there's going to come a time where you know so much that people will seek you out to do things and to accomplish things and lastly most important um, you're not here to perform uh, you are here to be yourself and the reason why uh, our elders and, and the committee has brought you is because they've seen the light of God in you so don't come here to perform and to prove anything. Allow yourself to be led by the Spirit, and you'll be just fine. We'll be just fine. Amen? All right. This morning, we are going to join Mary and Martha as we talk about rest as, as worship. And I'm not in any hurry to complete this lesson. You get it? Mary and Martha are going to help us find rest as worship this morning. Could, could, could we all stand so we can read our text this morning? We're going to read it as the church, as a body of Christ. <coughs> Luke 10 from verse 38, we read. As Jesus... Amen. You may be seated. Man, this is, this is nice. This is so nice. I like this. It's like very plush. I'm just going to sit here for a little bit and just relax myself. Oh, this is good. How are you doing? You know, right? Cool. Nice. This is really nice. They had water there. It's like, oh, it's hot. I think it should be like this. Oh, that's a spot right there. Ah, oh, man. Sure, come on, bring your pillow. I only got but one, and I ain't sharing. I got a hair in my mouth. Is something wrong? I mean, you guys are looking at me like something is wrong. I'm serious. Because um, something always has to happen, right? And at this point, you're expecting something to happen. Something is always happening. And when it's not happening, we wonder why is it not happening. But what happens when stuff stops happening? Oh, by the way, can you grab this one very quick? I'll come back for it. This is awkward. 
But Habakkuk 2.20 says that the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent. Let the people pause and rest from their commentary and their consternation and the ruckus of production. So we have these ladies in their house. And I'm not going to get into the fact that it, it is said in Scripture that it's, their, it's her house, it's Martha's house. This is loaded with good stuff, but I'm just here to focus on the rest in the situation. So there is something about Mary, but Martha as well. Actually, Martha is the feminine form of an Aramaic word which means Lord or Master. It's her house. But then there's another master. <laughs> In the house and one is listening and one is on pause one is focusing on the God man and the other just cannot turn it off because activity just have to be done and then God says you know through Christ of course only only one thing is needed many things has to be done but only one thing is and it's almost like um the wisdom literature that says, you know, um, there are six things that the Lord hates. Yay, seven. He's using this number play. But really, he's getting to really one thing. Resting in, resting with, adoring, listening to, worshiping Jesus. And both Martha and Mary at this point, they have a holy day. They have the Sabbath day. But as you can tell... It has not formed everyone because one is still busy and about the hubbub and the other is, is listening. And, and is our world really different? You know, John Comer says that um, in a world addicted to the two twin drugs or the twin drugs, accomplishment and accumulation, Sabbath is an act of resistance, almost like those Jedi, um, I don't watch them, but you know, I've heard about them, you know, the resistance. Um, it's a resistance to all other gods, to face and glorify the true God in just being. And what I surmise is that some of you all are here just trying to figure out when this sermon is going to end. Because you, you, you want to get to the next thing. Some of you guys are thinking about jobs and commitments. Because we don't rest very well. So you have 7-11, 24-7, and you have shifts. The reason why we have shifts is so that work does not turn off. So when one person gets off shift, guess what? Guess what? Another person gets on ship. Doing never stops. And our ideas on work. I mean, if you resist work, then you are lazy. So you have to be fruitful and always produce. And, and I know that there are some lazy people. I get that. But when we see rest as weak, as lazy, as unmotivated, as, oh, these slackers again, these freeloaders, and also sick people who can't really do stuff, or all the folks, some say, because I cannot do, then I have no value. Our ideas about production and rest leads us to unfairly judge our community. So Jürgen Moltmann uses his word to describe mankind. Homo accelerandus, he says, he has a great many encounters, but he does not really experience anything. Since although he wants to see everything, he internalizes nothing and reflects upon nothing. He has a great many contacts, but no relationships. We're going to get to that at the end of our sermon. Since he is unable to linger because he is always in a hurry, he devours fast food, preferably standing up. Because he is no longer able to enjoy anything. After all, a person needs time for enjoyment, and time is precisely what he does not have. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I'm looking at many of you. We never have time for anything. To fight against the rest of God, which leads us to worship, 
you have to accept the gods of production and alienating work which makes sure we will never truly be a worshiper fully aware worship will always be reduced to a time frame and not a posture so remember how we started this summon series with Cain and Abel the worship was a life offering and then we meander to Adam and Eve where in their work they helped each other to worship God through being stewards over the created environment. And then we are this third duo, Mary and Martha, where rest just cannot lay hold of Martha long enough for her to recognize in whose company she is. And so we are beings. We are beings but we are not really beings that are being we are beings that are doing so Kara root talks about human beings versus human doings and they're like well i'm a human being but in our life you know a reflection of our life we cannot be still we don't know how to be we don't know how to be and receive. We always have to be doing something. So, Carol says, Sabbath promises that when we stop and rest, God will remind us whose we are and help us remember who we are in bold defiance. Sabbath calls us to regularly step out of the mentality of constant anxiety and relentless productivity and into God's reality of fearless. Belonging and satisfied enough. Satisfied enough. So as we reflect upon the situation, we have two ladies and the big word in uh, that pericope is listening. I would have thought, you know, in listening you are being. Well, you're not being productive, you're not doing anything. Yes, you are. It depends on who you're listening to. Because a lot of folks have nothing to say. I mean, you are there and it's like, wah, 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 wah. But then to get in a space where God speaks, aha, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent and pause from production and consternation and the ruckus. Of just doing. So Jesus reminds Mary and Martha about the beginning. Because they forgot about what God did in the beginning. We're going to get to that in a little while. And people speak unintelligibly about the Bible. Well, the Old Testament is gone. So we don't keep a Sabbath day. You're right. I'm not talking about a day as much as I'm talking about a time. We're going to get to that. The command never left us. It is in the DNA of creation. It is in the life of Christ. And so Jesus did a lot of healing on the Sabbath day. And just so you know, healing comes from the same root word that salvation comes forth. And so I find it mind-blowing and strange that on the day of rest came salvation and healing. Resting allows you to receive the presence of God. And so that makes resting something that God uses to give you grace as you recognize His aura, who He is. To recognize that you're not in control that you need rejuvenation, that you need grace, and you have to be willing to sit still long enough to accept it and to look upon and to adore the grace giver. Jesus says, come unto me, all those that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Where's that pillow? And I will give you rest. This is a symbol of rest in our culture. Not a nap. Not a siesta. Jeff, go 
Don't go with it, okay? I'll come back for it. Right. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will show you how to worship, for in worshiping, you encounter healing. So Jesus heals and he saves on the day of rest, on the Sabbath day. The day we rest. God is in his holy temple. Let the earth keep silent. Where is the temple? Jerusalem? No. We are a holy habitation built up for the dwelling of the Spirit. So where is God? God is dwelling in his temples. There's too much talk going on. We keep silent and we listen for the God of the universe just might have something to say. We get to my favorite part, this contrast between the holy time versus a holy day. A holy time versus a holy... Are you guys still a little bit antsy this morning? Are you guys still antsy? Do you, you feel this message like kind of get into you? I'm taking my time. I'm in no hurry. Because I want you to get this. Six days. Six days. God pushes back chaos. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was all over the face of the earth, of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, I'm going to start production. I'm going to start ordering and structuring chaos and pushing back chaos God said let there be light of course there was light he saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness God called the light day and the darkness he called night now here's what I want you to focus on this tagline and there was evening and there was morning the first day now as you read verses 3 6 13 19 23 and verse 31 you have this Day one, two, three, four, five, six. At the end of every single day, there is, and there was evening, and there was morning. The first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. But, aha, you get, oh, I need my glasses. Oh, man, this, is, this one is going to be a little different, yeah. I should have blew that up a little bit. Not bad. No, I can see. All right. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Everything is done. Everybody say done. done. Well, done. well done. All right. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Kadosh. Yom Kadosh. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. There is no mention of an evening. There's no mention of a morning. It is just Yom Kadosh. And you might think, well, what does that mean? What significance is that, Brother Robbie? It is significant because there are no calendars at this time. There is not a structured day that humans have imposed on our living. And so day one, two, three, four, five, six, an evening and a morning, a day to a, a, a time to work and a time to rest. But then of the Sabbath day, it's just a kadosh. Yom Kadosh, a holy day. Wasn't compartmentalized into morning and evening. No talk of time frame. Just a consecrated, special, uncommon, not in terms of morality, but just in terms of time. And I'd like you to see that in history, Holiness. Are you guys with me? If you don't listen to anything I said in the sermon, listen to this and then you can check off or check out. <laughs> Holiness. 
was first ascribed to a time. Ooh, you, wait, 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 wait. I gotta, let me take my time. Holiness, right, you get it? Was firstly ascribed to a time. So before God said, you know, I'm going to give you ten commandments and then you have to be to me a holy people. And then they messed that up. And then we, we had the holy space, the tabernacle of the temple. Before all those things, holiness was time. So Abraham Heschel says, the sanctity of time came first. The sanctity of man came second. Sanctity of space came last. Time. So you didn't get to figure out what to do with time. I'm going to work. No, 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 no. God said, time is holy. You have to have a special time. God hallowed time and man hallowed the holy people through Moses and the tabernacle and the temple through man. And so, what is your point? What is your point? What are you getting at? God made room for stopping by firstly stopping himself. And in the New Testament, we have Jesus as he withdraws to pray and to rest. Many times on the journey toward Calvary. They had six days to be creative and to push back chaos into order and development and structure. Yet a day, a time to stop, to reflect on themselves as creatures basking in the glorious presence of the maker gave them a way back to center, to challenge the violence of work, and to give them a path to return from being lost. So here's the message for you and me. Conquering the external versus conquering the Internal. Um, let me see. I'm pick on somebody. Hey, Ivan. Yeah, it's easy to pick on. Hey, what's up, man? You good, bro? Looking good, man. Um, uh, what do you do for a living? What do you do? No, 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 no. You, no, like a profession. IT. He does IT. So, did you train for your IT stuff? Yes. Man, you're not working with me. You give me like short answers and stuff. I don't. I, uh. All right. So you train for IT stuff. So everyone in here who has a profession, they trained like Ivan, who is you know, kind of giving me the cold shoulder. You're going to buy food next time we go out. So you had to master the chaos of education. You had to learn principles. You had to learn definitions. You had to learn procedures. You had to learn protocols. All those things are just out there. And you had to figure them out so that you could repeatedly do your job, right? And we're all good at that. We are also very good at that because they pay us for it. You can pay your mortgage because you know as an architect, as a school teacher, as an IT professional, that you go to do a job that you know how to do. You're not just, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm just, no. They won't pay you. They will fire you if you can't do your job. Well, most places. I've seen other places where it's like, ah, I know, whatever. <laughs> but you know what? We spend so much time conquering the external that we can't conquer the eternal. We cannot turn it off. We cannot stop ourselves from working more than we, we worship. And so... Miss Ruth reminds us that if we were to survey the Ten Commandments, we see that there are nine commandments that um, take us out of slavery. <laughs> but there is one that takes the slavery out of us. Now, boys and girls, can you guess which one? <laughs> there are nine commandments that take us out of slavery. Physically, in relationships, you know, ordering, society and all those things, what to do, when to do, all those things. 
But there's only one that takes the slavery out of us, and that is the rest command. Replaces slavery with worship and healing. So the Sabbath reminds us who we are and whose we are. We belong to God and not to Pharaoh. Rest is not a reward for a job done well. Rest is the goal so that you can stand and sit and see God's salvation and feel God's presence and worship. Those set free from Egypt had never been free. And all of a sudden, they have all this time on their hands. All of a sudden, they are free. But they don't know how to put down the sickle. They don't know how to put down the mallet. They don't know how to stop creating and working. And so what do they do? They start building. Where, 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 where is Moses? Man, he's been gone such a long time. <laughs> I'm getting antsy. You know, I need to do something. And so what do you do when you have freedom and you've never been free? What do you do when... You've been enslaved for over 400 years. You go back to doing what you know how to do. The things that you've seen in Egypt. The building that you've done. You do it all over again. You construct a golden calf. I don't know what else to do. I'm just going back to do what I always have done being enslaved. You work, you build something, and you allow your work to keep alienating you in the direction of false gods all over again. Those that you have been building in Egypt. And you can do it very easily because of the muscle memory of slavery. So you think, oh, well, they're just being rebellious. They're, build, they're building a golden calf. No, they're struggling. Like you and I struggle. They've been working for so long, they did not know how to rest. And when you don't know how to rest, you build a bunch of golden calves. Simple. just wondering what's my golden calf I'm not talking about you I mean don't, don't look at me like I'm, talk, I'm jumping your fence I'm trying to wonder what's my golden calf because I know I have a few Sabbath is used by God to break the pattern of useless work so let's wrap this up Heschel says again, six days a week, we wrestle with the world, wringing profit from the earth. On the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in the soul. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. Six days a week, we seek to dominate the world. On the seventh day, we try to dominate ourselves. And I know some people are saying, well, that's never going to happen. You're so good at what you do. You're so concise. Concise. With everything on the outside. And everything on the inside is just going awry. <laughs> and you and I cannot see our awryness. But God can see and he invites you still to worship. It's not about a day. It's about a time. The first thing God hallowed was time. Andrew, in my pillow. The first thing that God hallowed was time. We don't, have time. we don't have time for time anymore. You can't even hear your voice. How are you going to hear God's voice? You can't even slow down enough to be in your thoughts. You always have to do something. Because we are running from ourselves and by extension, running from God. It's a nice pillow. Which one of you guys want it? Give it to a girl. Give it to, be nice. Give it to a girl. There you go. Nice. So, 
How can you worship a God you won't listen to? He says rest, you say no. How can God put his proverbial hands on you when you won't sit still? It's like, you know, catching crabs at um, a Florida coast to, to fish. It's like, one, one, they, they move so fast. They move so fast, man. I know it's funny, but that's us. We won't slow down enough for God to put his hands on us. We won't. Well, I've never received a word from God. How are you if you're resting? Well, I nobody got time for that. Rest? That's lazy. I mean, the only difference between us and the Israelites is years. That's it. Not sophistication. We're, we're all doing the same thing with different trappings. The only difference between me and an Israelite is years. So Cindy and Wilford, they have been married for about, what, 36 years. They raised three beautiful kids. And they're always going to practice, going to vacation, to this, to that. And at the end of the 36th year, when their kids are gone, they're getting divorced because they don't know each other. How do you spend 36 years in a house with somebody and not know the person? How do you spend 36 years in a house, Cindy, Wilford, with a person in the house, and you don't know the person? It is easy. Just, just be busy all the time. Don't sit to listen to one another, to have a conversation, to get to know. Because what you, you think once you get married, oh, I know the person. You don't know. That's just the first level. It's like playing Tetris. You just keep on building because there's a lot of layers that you don't even know about and, oh i didn't know that you know whatever you know uh, not me i'm just saying you know. <laughs> so you're coming to the lord's house for 50 years for 12 years for for five years you're coming to the lord's house and you think you know god But you do all the talking. God, I'm busy. God, I'll get to it. God, this, God, that. And he never gets in a word. What do you think is going to happen when your first big tragedy hits? What do you think is going to happen when you leave your mom and daddy's house? And you have to think for yourself. What do you think is going to happen when the fifth that you have gets challenged? He doesn't talk to me. I never knew him, so I'm gone. That's what's going to happen. It doesn't matter how many years you spend gathering at the altar of God. If you are not sitting still enough for God to talk to you, then you won't ever know who God is. And I'm not, I'm not saying go worship on a, on a Saturday at some church down the road. I'm not saying we should all of a sudden gather on, on Saturdays and not work. I'm saying you have to find a time because God hallowed time. You have time for everything else but worship, but rest, but worship, but rest. Let me conclude this morning. Peace be still. Hear God's word. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent. Let the people pause and rest from their commentary, from their consternation, from the ruckus of production to listen to God who just might have something to say. And that is worship. So think on this image as we close this sermon. Don't bring your work here. Don't bring your work here. Some of us, our value is what we can do. And when we can do, we feel value less. You like remember, don't perform. Just be who you are being led by the Spirit. And that's the message to me and to all of us. Because one of these days, performance will not be enough. Then what do you do? My being, my core, your being, your core, is wrapped up in being able to sit and listen to God who is in your temple. As we stand...
If you are here and you've been running, and you need to stop running, and you might be looking around thinking, well, all these folks have their ducks in a row and, you know, they are resting. No, we are the worst resters on earth. You talk to church people, we are the worst resters. But we want to do better. We want to invite God. We want to learn and to reprogram this thing. So we invite you into the beautiful struggle. You don't have to run and work and perform. You can come here and rest. You can come here and rest. We have water and we have word that will put you into the body of Christ. Where all these people are still trying to figure it out. But we know God does not fail. He will not fail. And where we end, his grace continues to go. So what do you want? You thought you were just coming to visit? And then you go have coffee or latte or, or some food? No. You've been running. You've been running, and you know it. Why not rest? Why not hear the word of God? And to all of us, especially like me who've done a poor job resting, why don't you take some time to rest beginning from today? And this is not talking about allowing the, your dishes to pile up in the sink. That's what people do all the time. They read this text and say, oh, just Leave your house in a mess and, you know, just go take a nap. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about resting in Jesus. Listening. So sometimes, you know, you have to do the dishes. And when I do the dishes, it, I listen, I, God is talking to me. It's, it's marvelous. Like we have a dishwasher and I hate that thing. Because my kids, they don't load it properly. So it's like, ah, why, when, we don't have to use it anyways. My bad, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not in a hurry to finish this sermon. I told you. I want to push you a little bit this morning. Because some of you can't wait to get out. Well, I got to go do this. I got to. No. What is God trying to tell you in this moment? Stop talking. Stop moving and fidgeting. Just rest and listen. It'll be, it's going to be weird. Because some of, some of us, we've never done that. And whenever you stop, it's like, Ooh, what, what, what was that? Yeah. It becomes weird. But embrace the weirdness. We are both spirit and flesh. Why do you think our supernatural God is not going to interact with us? So come all who that are heavy laden and under burdens. And receive God's rest from his word. Receive God's rest from his direction. Stop fighting and just worship. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for health, life, and strength. For knocking down the doors and for climbing those mountains, those peaks that we find ourselves traversing and the valleys that we hide in. Thank you for being relentless in pursuing us, Heavenly Father. And against all calamity, against all rage in the world, against all chaos, Heavenly Father, against all bad things, we stand there locked in defiance, saying we will not fear, we will not quit, we will continue walking boldly in confidence, facing the day, facing society. But this morning, more importantly, facing ourselves as we ask you to teach us once again how to rest. For your Lord who has bought a redemption, we pray. Church says amen. amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer.
All right, stay, you can stay standing just here for a moment. Uh, we've got a couple of things to announce. Uh, our sister Jacqueline Allen comes this morning with a couple of prayers that she's asking our family here to pray with her uh, for a couple of her relatives. Her sister Fran had a stroke a couple of weeks ago, is still in ICU, um, and uh, she really needs God's intervention for her health. She also has a, uh, a cousin, Keith, who's also recovering from a stroke. Um, we're going to pray for them in just a second. We also want to um, uh, welcome David Moore. I believe he's back here in the back right. If you'll raise your hand real quick so folks around you can see you, David. There we go. Uh, David's place of membership. We're glad in, uh, that uh, he's part of our family here. Let's go ahead and pray for Jacqueline and her, uh, her relatives, God. Dear God, uh, we know that you care for us. We know that you have, you are always watching out for our heart. God, uh, Jacqueline has a couple of relatives, her sister Fran, her uh, cousin Keith, God, who need your intervention, need your healing, God. We pray that you will be with them, that you will provide healing, provide peace, provide comfort, God. It's in your son's name we pray. I uh, did an activity with my students a few weeks ago. I had them sit in silence for five minutes. I didn't tell them how long they were going to be sitting there. And by the end, they said that was at least 30 minutes. All right, but it was only five I think that speaks to where we are in our society when we talk about rest. We're moving so quick that we never pause. So take a challenge, rest this week, and find the Lord. Have a great week.